Tanche, <laughs> good morning. Bonjour to all our pod listeners. We are so happy to be presenting another episode of Presenting Our Presence, which is a monthly vodcast that highlights the brilliance of Indigenous colleagues here at the University of Alberta. It is co-hosted by myself, Dr. Cadet, and my colleague, Florence, Dr. Florence Glanfield, and Kyle, our digital guru behind the scenes who helped make things happen. Today, we so appreciate having Evelyn Steinhauer joining us uh, to this episode, our 18th episode. How incredible, actually, I was realizing that. And so, Evelyn, welcome, and thank you for accepting our invitation to presenting our presence. So we invite you to introduce yourself in a way that is uh, meaningful to you. And thank merci you. for joining us. Merci for joining us, Evelyn. Thank you. I really am uh, really grateful that uh, I get to sit with two of you, the two of you today, and uh, I just greeted everyone in in the Cree language. I, I really hope that uh, you know that it inspires others to speak the language as well, their own language, to be, whether it's Cree or whatever language you speak. Um, I'm uh, my name is Evelyn Steinhauer at the in the Faculty of Education. I'm Dr. Evelyn Steinhauer. I'm a professor in the Faculty of Education, and uh, I'm also the director of the Aboriginal Teacher Education Program. I come from the Saddle Lake Cree Nation. I grew up in the nation and uh, lived most of my life there. Although, you know, a lot of my influence also has come from my grandparents, which is a whole other story because we really grew up with a real strong Métis influence as well. Uh, because of the uh, the upbringing of my of my pair of my uh, grandparents or my grandfather really, um, yeah my my father is uh, was the late Archie Steinhauer. My mother was Nancy Steinhauer. Uh, Whitford was her uh, maiden name, but really her her last name should have been Coraluk. So I'm just going to go into that just a little tiny bit, but just because I think it helps locate myself uh, a little bit better. So. My grandfather was uh, was born in 1907, and he uh, his parents came um, to Canada from the Ukraine. They came and they they got as far as Andrew, and his mother gave birth to him. Uh, so my grandfather is from uh, from uh, Galicia, uh, Ukraine. That's where his parents come from. If you look at his birth certificate, so his parents were Korluks. Uh, his mother was his father was a Korluk. His mother his father uh, his father was a Korluk. His mother was a Pauluk. When they came across, they said they stopped at Andrew around the Andrew area, uh, Victoria Settlement or the Métis Métis Crossing around that area. Gave birth to him, and she died. She passed away giving birth. So he was about seven days old already, and just living on wheat girl. And a Métis family came across the dad um he had no guns he had nothing to provide for his family with and the the uh, mother took him in and she said you know what we will look after him we will we will uh provide for him and and she, i don't know if she was breastfeeding or if she had access to a bottle whatever it was but she took my grandfather in and and he he lived with them he lived with them until uh when he was five years old, his family came back. His dad came back. He had remarried, came back to uh, to get him. And he said in Cree, when, when it, when tan, utoma, you know, this is where I'm from. This is who I, I belong to. So although my grandfather was full-blooded Ukrainian, his he was really influenced by the Métis culture. And as a result, we were as well. And so we grew up listening to fiddle music. Unfortunately, we didn't grow we didn't grow up going to ceremonies and to powwows and which you know once in a while we did when when family would come down we would all go to treaty days in Saddle Lake. But my influence really was my grandparents uh, from my mom's side. And and I think the reason for that as well is because my father passed away when I was 12 years old. So a lot of a lot of uh, time was spent with my my maternal grandparents and uh they they uh took us in 
they you know we we got on the bus from their home they lived just outside of goodfish lake so way at now and going back to the steinhauer side my great 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 grandfather henry bird steinhauer comes from the rama ontario area so he was born ojibwe and then was schooled uh he was taken when he was 12 years old to be schooled as a missionary they took him across the border and uh the reason we ended up with a last name of Steinhauer was because the benefactor, the person that that sponsored him, was a Steinhauer. So that's where the Steinhauer last name comes from. But it's always amazing when I go east, you know, around the uh, Ram Ontario area, how I feel so at home. You know, even though it was it was not in Rama, but it was close to Rama, it felt like I was home. So it's when you think about cellular memory, when you think about blood memory, it's uh, it's really amazing. So my grandfather on the Steinhauer side was an educated man. His kids were educated. In fact, one of his sons who got a degree in, in 1898 was enfranchised. Somewhere along the way, he got his status back though. I don't know if it was through adoption, but somehow he got his status back. So it's a really rich history. Um, a lot of education comes from, you know, from that Steinhauer side. When when Henry Bird Steinhauer was was educated, he became a teacher. Although he was trained as a missionary, he was he was teaching children. Um, the, how did he end up west? Well, he really ended up uh, west because of his missionary work. So he he was at. Uh, Cumberland House, I believe. Uh, he, he kept moving further and further this way, and uh, when he got when he got to uh, Saskatchewan, he met my my great 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 grandmother, and and they married. And as a result, more Cree was spoken, and I think that's how we ended up being Cree. But really, my background on that side is is Ojibwe, is Anishinaabe. So it's it's really interesting. Um, he, he was a missionary. Uh, he settled, first of all, in the Lackawish area, and they moved to the Whitefish Lake area, which is just, well, Goodfish Lake, Whitefish Lake. You know, it's, just, it's the same area. And uh, that's where my mom and, and her siblings were raised. And uh, so really strong uh, Christian background on that side. Uh, he uh, passed away in the late 1800s. But the other thing is my connection to Métis Crossing not only is from my grandfather on, on my mom's side, but also my great-great-grandfather from the other side. So that's a very long introduction, but I think it's really important that, uh, I, that I locate myself. And sometimes people wonder why we are the way we are, but when you think about it, genetics has a lot to do with it as well. Um, even, even with my grandfather being Ukrainian, but raised as a Cree man, he spoke fluent Cree, broken English, but yet he had this Ukrainian accent when he spoke, and yet that wasn't his influence, right? But a lot of his characteristics were very, very Ukrainian. So, uh, you know, sometimes it's the environment, sometimes it's genetics, but, you know, a combination of that is uh, results in who I am today. It's so important. Thanks for kind of locating yourself in that way, Evelyn, because it speaks to, like you said, the rich history, the complexity of identity, and there's nothing simplistic about it, right? When you think about all the different relations, the movement, mm -hmm. um, and then how it connects us to what is home, connects us to that feeling of what is home mm -hmm. and connection to that history. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and then what influences those what's the influencers right the space the people the language and it's interesting back home the people we we thought they were ukrainian but they're actually would refer to themselves as galatians mm -hmm. the galician it's we'd say in michif and so even that whole connection to galatia which i'm not even sure is it you know there's a kind of a whole complexity of that history exactly exactly well, that we're not separate, that influences Absolutely. You're absolutely right. Yeah. You know, so mm -hmm. yeah. Merci for that. And, 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 and one element you speak of, I think is so interesting about the education, mm -hmm. right? the influences of who educated the grand, your grandparents, but how education was also important. And here you are at the University of Alberta, really continuing that value 
or that way of how would you speak to how that's influenced what you do now at the University of Alberta and your contribution and you being really leading a whole new way of thinking about education for our mm-hmm. future teachers? Yeah, that's a really good question. Just going back to the Steinhauer line, my grand, my father, who passed away when I was 12 years old, was a journeyman carpenter. So within, within our communities, there were no journeyman carpenters going back to the 60s. So there were there were very few. So he, he was a journeyman carpenter, as was my uncle Ira Steinhauer. So there were two of them from one community and there were none in other communities. So they were not only the only journeyman carpenters, but they were also the house inspectors. So, you know, homes were coming up in Coal Lake, in Fort Chip, in Frog Lake. So all the surrounding communities in Goodfish Lake and so forth. So they would travel. I hardly saw my dad because he was always traveling. But, you know, as I was doing my doctoral work is when I really got to know my dad. And it's it's amazing how people are put on your path that are supposed to be on your path. Um, I really uh, used to struggle because my my work, my doctoral work was about school choice. So uh, I wanted to know why parents who have the option of sending their children to the on-reserve school or off-reserve school, so we had that, they had that option, made the choices that they did. And my dad decided that he wanted us schooled off-reserve. I went to uh, day school for one year and then we were taken off reserve. So I don't know why I was not kept on the reserve school, why I was taken off. Maybe because my older brother was going off reserve, but what whatever the reason is, I wanted to know. And that's when I really started getting to know my father. It was not even an exploration of my father. It was an exploration of that their choice. Uh, so I got to learn that my father was, um, you know, very involved in the education in Saddle Lake, that he did a lot of. So I always feel like I carried on his work. Once I learned that, I felt like it was already predestined. So even before I was born, I was the one that was chosen to to continue for to continue this work. And I'm sure he he probably prayed for one of his children to continue that work. Um, he, he, my father was only 39 years old when, when he passed away. So all I knew was that he was a journeyman carpenter. Little did I know that he was really community involved, that he was, you know, the president of the co-op pro, the co-op store and the co-op organization in Saddle Lake. I didn't know any of that about my dad, nothing. I didn't know how influential he was, uh, with the curriculum that was, you know, that they were talking about things that we're talking about today. I had absolutely no clue, but you know, people were aligned. People were put on my path. I remember going to, um, to, uh, a retreat with our, our graduate students, or maybe I was a graduate student. Yeah. I, I was a graduate student at that point. And, and there was an elder there and he told me about my father. Like, I, I didn't know. I had absolutely no clue. Um, one of the things that always stands out for me is I was at a uh, funeral in Saddle Lake and one of the uh, elders that was speaking spoke also about uh, the divisiveness in our communities between, you know, the religions. And one, one of the things that he was saying as he was at the podium was my father was talking about how we can't let religion you know, get in the way of, of our inv- advancement. He talked about how, uh, apparently he was talking about how we have to remember that we're Indians first, that that's what we have to go by. We have to go with uh, our, our own uh, ways of being, ways of knowing as we move forward and don't let this divisive nature of religions uh, cause, you know, cause separation between, between uh, relationships particularly between families, because some families would be Catholic and some would be Protestant, and it was causing division. And when I came to the university, that is what I wanted to study. What impact did that divisive nature have on our identity development, on on school success and so forth? But for some reason, again, it's I, I believe there's no coincidence, I was steered in the other direction about education. And as a result of the work that I was doing, I got to listen to parents and I got to hear their stories. I got to listen to some of the youth 
Like, why is it that, you know, how, how is it that you completed high school and others didn't and so forth? So there were so many beautiful stories, um, but that's a whole other topic. Uh, so yeah, so really, I think the reason I'm here today is because of all those descendants that came before me. I'm here only because of that. And I also think a lot about, you know, the people at Blue Quills in the, when they were taking over the school in the early 1970s. I was married into the Makokas family at that point, and my mother-in-law was Alice Makokas, who was very instrumental in the takeover. She was working at Indian Affairs at that point, and she overheard uh, a meeting where the town was going to try to where they were trying to uh, offload the school to the town for a dollar, town of St. Paul. And so she rallied the communities and she uh, she uh, got them thinking about having our own school. So to make a long story short, we all know about the 1970-71 sit-in. We know uh, we know those those folks that sat at that table, but really my my mother-in-law was the one that sparked it for me, sparked education. Um, so there, there's a whole story about that sit-in. And, and I know at that point they were praying us. They were praying for us. They were praying for the next generation. They were praying that they could have a school. So as Noella, Dr. Noella Steinhauer says, they prayed us into these positions. Each one of us that's sitting in here are here because people like them in our communities were praying for us. Because when you look back at that point, uh, when they were asking what, what level of education people had, people had, you know, mostly elementary. There were a couple that had grade eight, but more than that, there was no one. There was no one that went beyond that. So when you think about it, they had really big dreams. And I'm so glad that they thought of us in those dreams. So again, I was really fortunate that I married into that family because I was supposed to be there. She was supposed to guide me. So uh, when I graduated from high school, I uh, started working at the band office. And then and then um, I had a baby. And when my baby was, when, when my oldest daughter was 18 months old, um, she, uh, she said to me, Evelyn, you need to go to school. And I said, I can't. I, I would love to, but I can't because all I of all that was playing in my my head was the recording that you can't go to university and again a whole other story i was you know when i was moving from grade nine to grade 10 i was i was streamed into the non-academic route although i tried for a year they put me back so i was doing um, vocational sort of training so i was i learned to be a secretary so when when i came out of university i went to, I went to the work at the band office and then she convinced me to take a secretarial and office admin course. Actually, it was a clerk typist course from uh, AVC, Alberta Vocational College that was being brought to Blue Quills. So that's how my career started. Is she believed in me so much. She got me funding the last minute and uh, I excelled in the, in the program. It was a one year certificate program and I excelled because not only where as it was I learning clerical skills, I was also learning accounting, you know, English skills. Um, she really set me up for success and I didn't even know it. So then after I, I finished that work, I went to work at the government. Um, they had a native internship program. So when we think about the university um, and how, how um, you know, sometimes some of us don't get to the university, there was, you know, when they had programs, these special initiative programs, I got into the government. That government work was really, really hard. I was an un un unemployment insurance agent. Now they're called employment insurance agents, but that's what I was. I worked as an unemployment insurance agent for several years. And in, 19, uh, in 1986, so I'm really dating myself here, but in 1986, I was... So, cause I started there in 82 and I worked until 86. And then I started uh, really developing these migraines because there was a lot of racism. Um, people didn't like to be served by an indigenous agent, by a Cree agent. Um, I started uh, getting migraines. So then I said, you know what? I got to get out of here, but I don't know how. So again, my mother-in-law in the picture, she said, you should just go to university. 
So I started university one course at a time to begin with. And I would take an afternoon off and I would drive to Blue Quills. Thank goodness for Blue Quills. I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for Blue Quills uh, University or college back then. So I would drive for an afternoon and I remember taking courses. And then I finally decided in 89 that I was just going to uh, go for, no, it was in later 86, the late, at the end of 86, after one term, I decided I'm going to go full time. And I ended up with a Bachelor of Arts degree from the Athabasca University. And uh, again, she, my mother-in-law talked me into that. She said, you could do this. And so I ended up with a degree. I went back to work for the, for the band for a little while, but it didn't, it, it, I didn't find my place there. So then I went back to the government, believe it or not. So I stayed at the government a total of 13 years. And then again, in 1996, they were downsizing they were or restructuring. So they were moving our unemployment insurance files to Edmonton. So then I decided, well, I'm going to apply for the package. They gave out a really good pa uh, package so that I, we could leave. Uh, I took it in July, but they kept me up until the end of uh, December. And then I went to work at Blue Quills. Very, very not coincidental, but that path led me to Blue Quills. And I started working there as an uh, as a registrar assistant, because I thought I'm going to take any job. And I got to know the university system really, really, really well. Um, I knew transfer credit. I knew everything that I needed to know about uh, working at a university. And then, and then after that, I, I, uh, I applied for a director of student services, and I ended up working at, in that position for uh, several years at Blue Coals as well. So yeah, all of that. All of that to tell you that, yeah, this, this, that's how I ended up at the university. University of Alberta. I know one of the pieces when we're talking about is your passion of the ATIP program. And as you're sharing, I can't help but think a couple things. It's like the that we belong to that prayer of our ancestors. What a beautiful way to situate ourselves and um, and increasingly encourage the next, you know, the the generations, our family around us to think that way. That's where I'm at as well. It's like, oh, we have we come from people of resistance and those mothers and those grandmothers. Mm -hmm. And setting you up for everything to set you up for success. And mm -hmm. I thought, well, here you are, um, the director of the ATIP program. And I can only imagine that that's what you're also bringing mm -hmm. to those students that are part of the ATIP program. Can you tell us a little bit about that the ATIP program and, and what it means, what that acronym is. Mm -hmm. and, um, yeah, and your role there and what Absolutely. students can accept. Yes. What, what, what can we expect as a student, let's say, who registers to become of that program? Because, right. wow, can you imagine right. if we had that 20 years ago? You know, I could talk now. about it probably for a very long time, but we'll, <laughs> we'll try to keep it a little short. So when... ATEP really came to me at Blue Quills when I was working there. So it uh, it's the first intake of ATEP students. The Aboriginal Teacher Education Program was in 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 2001, uh, although they didn't start until January 2002. But Blue Quills was the first cohort. So I was working at Blue Quills at the time that they started it, and I was really really interested in 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 it. It was it was like all of a sudden I was just so passionate about something. And uh, so I, I followed it for a while. I came back to the university in, in, in the fall of 2000, fall of 2001 to do my master's degree, but they had already started it. They had already done their intake. I, I went, I did my master's in a year. I, so I had a, a one year leave of absence from Blue Quills. And I, I came back uh, to, to them in, in the fall of 2002. So after a year, I had a master's degree. And then I decided it was not enough. I wanted to do my PhD. So right from the hop, I've been watching ATAP. I've been I, I've been really a part of a, a part of the process in my head, at least. Maybe I would, didn't have my fingers and everything. So when I became a graduate student in in uh, 
at the University of Alberta or a PhD student in 2003, I got to be part of the process still. So I got my hands in there. First of all, I started working at the Aboriginal Student Services Centre, which is now the First People's House. And, and working as an advisor. So some of the people were, you know, in, inquiring about the program. So in that way, but in 2005, I started working as a graduate assistant and doing some work with ATAP. So it, that, that got my hands in there. I started teaching in ATAP. It was, it was just something that I just loved. And what I really, really loved was the transformation, seeing the transformation of students that come into the program. So ATEP has really evolved from that time. So it used to be a two plus two. The colleges would do the first two years and, and the University of Alberta do, would do the last two years. And really that 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 model came from even the Morningstar program, which was there at Blue Coals in the 70s. So they it was flipped, though. They did uh, two years. Uh, they did two years at the college. Um, I think they were doing more of their uh, curriculum instruction courses. Well, I don't know if it's completely flipped, so let's take that back. But they did a two plus two as well. So they did have to come to the university. That was different. So when we do two plus two at Blue uh, uh, in ATEP right now, what happens is they stay at their colleges. We go out to the colleges. But when they did the two plus two before, they had to actually come to the University of Alberta. So those first women like Florence, uh, uh, not uh, Phyllis Cardinal, you know, Pat McCocus, all of uh, Diana Steinhauer, all of these people, uh, Sarah Price, they all started that way, but they had to come to the University of Alberta. They had to actually brave it and come here. If you look at that list, there's, there's a whole wham of, uh, you know, a whole bunch of people that actually started. And many of them are very successful today. All of them are very successful today. They're all doing wonderful work. They're in leadership positions, but they're the ones that actually were the real influencers behind uh, ATAP. So ATAP started off as a two plus two. We did that until 2017. In 2017, we decided uh, with community, so much community consultation and community input to uh, try something on campus. So we started a secondary program on campus where students uh, were initially, we thought they would come started year one, but what happened is students, some of them started in year one, I think there were, may have been 10 of them, but then they started coming with credits they started coming as after degree students. So some of those students, although we had funding only for a short period of time for four years, we still have some students in that program because they came in later, they came in with after degrees. But I think after this year, they'll pretty much all be done. So we would have graduated over 30 students in that secondary program. And then in 2018, there was a, a call for proposals for an expansion grant. So now ATEP is, is, is really uh, grown tremendously. We have about a 215 students where we used to have 25 or 40. We now have 215 ATEP students. So we have two online cohorts. So the, those students are studying anywhere uh, across Canada. So there's, they're spanned across six provinces. They're studying online. They're, they mostly study synchronous so that we could build communities. Um, they speak, uh, the, the students are coming from nine different language groups. So we encourage them to come from their own place of knowing, to bring their languages in. We also have a, a, one cohort of students on campus that's starting in year one. Again, some of them are coming with different cred credentials, but there's a group of 30 so uh, that are studying on campus as well. Um, so we've got, we've also this fall started a part-time program because we really were listening to communities and they wanted to hear what we, uh, what we could offer. So those people that were working as EAs in schools, they could not afford to take off and go to school. So we, we started them off in a part-time program. So they take two courses per term. This is the first term and it's going really, really well. And they, they continue to work as TAs in their community. So they're studying in the evenings, two evenings a night. I mean, two evenings a week. So it's, it's just wonderful opportunity. They'll become teachers in six years. So the last year of their program, they'll have to take off for their, uh, for their field experiences. So they'll have their 
uh, initial field experience and then they'll do their advanced program or advanced experience. So that'll be the last year of their program. So it's it's a really wonderful opportunity for people to become teachers uh, when they would probably not ever have that opportunity. And I think that's what really moves me to ATAP. I am so passionate about ATAP because I know the transformation that happens. You know, I, I was thinking about uh, my own community of Saddle Lake. Saddle Lake has probably got about 90% of the teachers in their schools are Indigenous, which is which is amazing. And it's because of ATAP. It's, and, and I see the difference. I see second generation of ATAPers coming now because their mothers have come through the program. Um, when we when we first started ATEP, when we were smaller, we made sure that we developed really uh, strong relationships with students. They weren't just numbers. These students became our family. Uh, we became the aunties. We became the kookums to these these students that were studying. They all had. Uh, Angela Wolf and I were working together at the time. There were only a couple of us where we have a team of six now. There were only two or three of us working, but they would have our cell numbers. They would call us at any time, you know, so we were there for them 24 seven. And uh, those students remember that. Those students remember feeling loved. Those students remember feeling like they belonged. So uh, they encourage others. We don't do recruitment at ATEP much like other programs. The students that have graduated become the recruiters. Um, people who see us, you know, uh, at ATEP because we're Indigenous or see us at the university um, look look to us and they, they, they want that experience as well. So, you know, we don't really have to do any recruiting. Uh, it, it, just, it just happens naturally with the last intakes all we did is put it on facebook and then we, and then the ateppers or the graduates would jump in and say you've got to do this program this is the program that you've got to get through they love you they care for you they uh they uh this is where you build community so there's so many wonderful things that have happened in atep when i uh i'm on instagram and i see atep graduates buying homes when I see ATEP graduates talking about their student, their children graduating from high school, you know, when I see ATEP graduates, uh, you know, taking these big worldly trips, I think how their lives have changed because of ATEP, because somebody gave them a chance. Somebody loved them, somebody cared for them, somebody held their hand, not enabled them, but held their hand so that they could get through the program. And, and that's why I love the work that I do because I know it, and, and I've said it before, it saves lives. ATEP saves lives. ATEP has saved my life as well. Because you know, there's times that working at the university is very, very difficult, but I stay there because I know we need to get these students through this program so that they could be standing in front of our children. My, uh, my grandchildren for the first time went to Saddle Lake School last year and they're being taught by ATEP graduates. When, when they come home and they say, Auntie Penny said this, and, they, and they're, they're enunciating their Cree words so perfectly, I think we've done a really good job. Not, not in a, uh, you know, I say that with humility. I say it with, uh, with respect for uh, those people that come through the program but I know we've, we've made a difference I know that uh, things are different in communities because we have ATEP when you think about the students that are coming from from the north you know far north in Nuvik Northwest Territories Northern Ontario Northern BC some of them they're the first graduates first ones to have ever graduated from high school. They're the first ones to ever go to university. So it's a really big deal. It's so it's such a big deal. And as a result, their children are watching that. They're going to go to university. And oftentimes they're leaving community for the first time. Mm -hmm. So imagine arriving with this community that's set up and waiting for them to care for them and love them through the ATEP program. Wow, thanks so much for sharing. I knew of ATEP, uh, but I didn't know the origins and the whole inspiration behind or the set of values and even the, the, the framework of becoming each other's kin and family. 
Mm-hmm. That's and no, so, what, no way to set up for success, right? Right. There's, so in, in, in ATEP, even though we have, sorry, Cindy, okay. in ATEP, even though we have so many different language groups, yeah. We, yeah. we make it known that we're really guided by these, these Cree values. And we encourage other speakers to bring in their own values as well. Like one of the things that we really think about in ATEP is Mamo Gamatuan. ATEP is not competitive. You know, although we we will have, because we do accept Indigenous and non-Indigenous students into the community-based programs, uh, some in the online programs, but we encourage people to work together. So it's not about competition. So there's a different worldview that's embedded within the program, right? Miwititu and getting along together. Tapatimuen, remaining in humility. Like those are the values that guide us, just some of the values. There's there's 13 values that we have on our walls. And we remind people to look at those and to really internalize them because that's how we're gonna get through the program. We don't want, it doesn't matter. Although, you know, 25%, 30% some years graduate with honors. It's not about competition. It's about making sure that everybody gets through the aid to program. I'm going to Florence ask, I know the two of you have worked together for years. Is there any questions or wonders um, that you'd like to add? Well, first of all, Evelyn, I just have so appreciated hearing the way you situated yourself and then relationship to ATEP. And one of the um, pieces that really resonated for me as I listened to the um, what you shared with us is the ways in which um, your experiences and who you are today were shaped by the generations before you and how all of the work that you're doing today is shaping the future for the next generations. And one of the, um, one of my mentors and elders was Dr. Cecil King, the late Mm -hmm. Dr. Cecil King. And when I first met him, He talks so profoundly about that. And um, when I think about the ways in which you're seeing the examples with your grandchildren coming home and talking about who the teachers are, right? You are also living in and shaping the next seven generations. So it's so beautiful to hear your story of how you came to the University of Alberta and then how is it that the work is moving forward? Mm Mm-hmm. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, You just reminded me, I think, you know, being at the university is a privilege, but it's also sometimes very difficult, as as you both know, Uh, because we're living in a world that's not ours. You know, we're we're bound by policies that are not ours that somehow sometimes restrict us. So that's as much as I, you know, I, I think I mentioned a little bit earlier It's ATEP that keeps me there. And it's the graduate students in the Indigenous Peoples Education Specialization that I supervise, or those that are coming through the MES program. Those are the ones that keep me here. You know, when we have to fight those battles about how to get honoraria, or when we're we're asked to, you know, to make sure that we, we get our paperwork in months in advance or weeks in advance, and they don't understand why we have to wait until the last day sometimes. Um, it, it just frustrates me because one of the things that people don't take into consideration is there's a different worldview at play here. Within within our Indigenous content, you know, there's that whole notion of bastahu and, you know, sinning and crossing boundaries. And we take that very seriously. So if we try to uh, manage our own worlds and try to plan so far in advance, we're causing an imbalance. And a lot of elders will not give you a commitment until the day before. So sometimes we're running to the financial office asking for dollars the day before, but people don't understand that. So there's so many different things that I could talk about, but again, a whole other session that, that doesn't fit. And I think the other thing that happens at the university that sometimes is really troubling for me is the fact that there's many people that are coming forward claiming Indigenous identity, and they're not. And that really sets us back as well, because we're coming in with this worldview, we're coming in with, you know, this non-competitive mindset. And then, and then you have people that come to the universities that 
are coming and they, you know, they might have indigenous ancestries from ancestry from way back, but they don't have the lived experience. So what happens is it cancels out our way of being our way of knowing it cancels out the progress sometimes that we make when we talk to APOs about, you know, looking at our worldview or, you know, the people that uh, hold on, hold on to the finances. When we talk about them uh, to them about why we're doing things a certain way, it's, it puts us back when we have a person who doesn't have the lived experience come in and, and, and basically dismiss everything that we said, because, we have short-term memory sometimes, you know, at the university. So when we when we do, when we make some progress, sometimes it's erased by people who don't have the lived experience but are claiming identity because then you're supposed to be like them to see how do I put myself forward? If I don't do the, if I don't fit the, you know, 40, 40, 20, then how do I put my package forward for full professor? Um, so you need guidance. But then, but then you have other that are others that are going forward that are claiming indigenous identity that looks perfectly aligned with the 40, 40, 20. Because for us as indigenous scholars, service is everything. You know, we, we are in the community 24 seven, whether we're there physically or not, but we're with our community comes first. So the way that our distribution looks is very different. And, and often, you know, the way that we do research is very different. Like I do research on an ongoing basis, probably like both of you. It's ongoing. It might not be written. There might not be a, an article at the end of it, but we're doing it on a consistent basis. But then when we go put our packages forward and then we have a person that's claiming indigenous identity, you know, um, it looks it looks very mainstream. So then it dismisses what we're doing as well. So I can imagine the conversations that happen at FEC when it comes to seeing our packages because they look different. Um, much of the work that I do is 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 service oriented. It's for it's for the community, and there's no separation. There's no line between service, research, and teaching. We teach all the time. You know, and and so the other the other thing that happens, and and you both know, is we're we're asked to do everything, but yet it doesn't count get counted. So we're the experts in all these areas. Although I would never consider myself an expert, but we're experts. We're expected to be experts in all these areas, but then when it comes to reporting, there's no room on the on the uh, uh, faculty annual reporting system that takes into consideration that that work that we do, or even the type of awards that we get. I don't put my name forward for awards, but it, it, if community is going to nominate me for an award, that means way more to me than, than it would if, if I, you know, if, if, if I had applied for this really prestigious award, because to me, those community awards mean way more. When I get a blanket put on my shoulders and, and a, and an honor song sung for me, that's, I'm going to list that on my CV because that means way more to me than a, um, than a teaching award that I might've got from the university. So that, uh, I remember at Blue Quills one day, the students honored me that way. They had other classes come and they sang for me and they, they sat me in the middle and they wrapped me in a blanket. And to me, that was the teaching award that I needed. It wasn't that that plaque that hangs on my wall. It, it, it wasn't that at all. It was it was that blanket. And I, I hold that blanket really, really tightly or all those blankets that I was wrapped with, because to me, that means way more. But how do you put that on a report? So when you have people that come in that claim indigenous ancestry or indigenous identity that don't have the lived experience, they don't know about that. They haven't felt it because it's a feeling. It's a spiritual uh, way of being and it's very sophisticated it's our indigenous ways of being is a very sophisticated way of being um, and in our languages uh, tell us how to live our languages you know talk about kinship and relationships the way that we relate to one another you know when I say you know my friends that are sitting here on the screen that's so that that's so much more endearing or when your mom calls you Nitanis, you know, my girl, my daughter, 
that's so much more meaningful than an award. But nobody, people that come in and pretend to be us don't have that experience. And as a result, it, it pushes us back. It pushes us back. And I think that's why many people will not apply. You know, once you get to associate professor, because the 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 move to tenure has been so damaging, they won't move any further. So somehow, you know, we need to support one another. We need to be there when somebody's putting together these packages. We need to be there listening to each other when we have these these issues that have come up because people don't understand us. So there's so many challenges that I had over the years being the ATEP director because people didn't understand me. But but like I said, I stayed there because I knew I was making a difference. I stayed there because I wanted to see the day when my grandchildren were being taught by ATEP graduates. That's why I stayed there. And, you know, I'm getting closer to retirement. And I hope that the rest of my days could be spent making a difference for people that come across or come to my come to work with me as a as a graduate student or come to ATAP and I get really emotional sorry uh, but that's I'm so passionate about the work that I do and that's what keeps me here because I think every one of us sitting on the screen would not be here if we didn't have that same passion because universities can kill us you know universities can really damage our, 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 our spirit because it goes against everything that we are. And then and then all of that, which is a whole other topic with the pretendians that are coming into the universities and, and really causing havoc, that's a whole other conversation. But I think it's one that we need to explore. And, and I know Florence is involved in the group because I've been at, 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 at the last symposium. You might have been there too, Cindy, but we need to start talking about these things in safe spaces. We need to start talking about how it really sets us back. Like I had to go through all of this pain, all of this experience, and yet you can jump in when you're in your 30s or 40s and say you're indigenous, but you never had to endure, you know, go through what we did. Uh, but yet, but yet you're you're the one that's rewarded because you look like them. You look, you don't look like the like us. You know, your experience is different. What we do as Indigenous scholars is good for all faculty members because, you know, when you honor relationships, when you honor kinships, when you honor Wagutuin, that's what brings us together. You can't do one without the other. All of those things are go hand in hand. So what we do here is good for everyone because we do need to get to know each other. Thank you.